Good evening. Welcome to our Old Testament Bible study here at Cleveland Community Chapel. Christmas week. Here we are Sunday night already before Christmas. So if you're watching Sunday nights, if you haven't seen Sunday mornings, even if you were at church this morning, let me go let me invite you to go back and watch Sunday morning service because it's different. It's not during the church service. It was something we did right after church, so we'd put something on the internet. A little Christmas special. Big week coming up this week. Uh, Tomorrow night, if you go out at uh, dusk, you can see the Christmas star that hasn't been in the sky in 800 years. It's an alignment of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, southwest horizon, horizon about dark. We'll be back here on Wednesday evening, Christmas Eve Eve, for our New Testament study in 2 Corinthians. And then on Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, we've got a special weekly word Christmas special for you. You don't want to miss that one be on Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock. Of course, you can go back and watch these at any time. They're, they're all archived. But here we are in our Old Testament study. We're in chapter 17 of Genesis, continuing with the story of Abraham. God meets with him every few years and reminds him, Abraham, I'm making promises to you. Your seed, your descendants are going to be like the, the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heaven. Uh, God promises him two things, basically, progeny and land. So tonight he's going to give him, once again, he's already told him, but he's going to reiterate the deed to the promised land to Abraham and his descendants forever. But as you know, Abraham's a human being. And uh, as years go by, Abraham's faith begins to weaken a little bit. And him and Sarah, they thought we better help God out because he keeps promising us kids. And here we are getting up here in our 90s and we don't have no kids. And... Abraham, maybe you can go into my handmaid, uh, Sarah. He may have been in his 80s then because I think Ishmael's 13 or 14 in tonight's chapter. But uh, regardless, God wanted them to know and wants us to know that this is a miracle birth that's about to happen. <laughs> chapter 17, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. That's the first time we get this name for God in the Bible. It's El Shaddai, God Almighty. He says, Abram, my name's God Almighty. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, that was quite a command. Abram wants you to be perfect. Abram was a human being. I done said that, right? But you know, God doesn't expect anything less than us. He wants you and I to be perfect. And you say, well, I can't be perfect. No, but uh, that ought to be our goal, right? realizing uh, because what it does, it makes us realize God expects us to be perfect, but I can't be perfect. Therefore, I, I'm going to rejoice and rely on God's grace. By the way, that's in the New Testament. Nobody less than Jesus himself said it. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, have you been as perfect as God Almighty even one day, just today? No, of course you haven't. Don't put that hand down out there. <laughs> Nobody's as perfect as God. Therefore, thank him for his grace. I want to be perfect, Lord, but I thank you for your grace. Be perfect, Abram, verse 2, and I'll make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. He fell on his face prostrate before God, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my, co my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be called any more Abram. So I've referred to him as Abraham all throughout here. See, God changed his name at this point. Abram meant high father, which is kind of funny. All, of, all these years, here he is getting close to 100 years old, and all of his life he's been called high father. He don't have any kids. <laughs> Can you imagine a, a bunch of travelers come by and stop by his oasis one day and say, what's your name? He said, high father. And they said, well, where's your kids? And he said, I ain't got none. They probably laughed and rode off, right? But God said, you ain't going to be called high father anymore. You're going to be called Abraham, which means a father of many nations. But thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now we look back today and we say, you know what? Now that little boy Ishmael came the whole Arab nation. Now this little boy Isaac that we ain't, he ain't got here yet, out him became the whole Jewish nation. But as Paul explains to us over in the New Testament in Galatians that uh, the, 
we're the children of that promise. We Christians, we're, we're Abraham's descendants by faith. We're like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens. And that's the New Testament church. And it can be made up of uh, both Arabs and Jews and even room for us Gentiles in it. Father of many nations. Your name will be called Abraham, made you father of many nations. And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. Kings will come out of you, Abraham. And boy, you look back through history and all them Arab kings even down to today. All them uh, Jewish kings even down to today. And you say, even the king of kings, Jesus Christ, Kate was a descendant of Abraham. And you know what over in the book of Revelation in the New Testament it says about Christians? It says our position with God through Christ. He says, I've made you kings and priests under our God. Actually, I think that's in, in Peter's epistle. I've made you kings and priests unto our God. So we're still kings coming out of him. Kings will come of thee, and I'll establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, that's your descendants down through the ages, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And let me say something. If you want to do some extra study, read Genesis 17 that we're going over here tonight, and then, and then flip over to the New Testament and read Romans chapter 4. And if you can find something that commentary that commentates in the New Testament on the Old Testament, you say, well, there's the best commentary on that I could ever find. So read Romans chapter 4 and see what the Holy Spirit's commentary through the pen of Paul is about the Abraham story here. And that's just one of the places, but Romans 4 is really a powerful one to lay over beside of Genesis 17. To your seed after you, generations, verse 8, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, God speaking to Abraham, the land, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. Now, if God gave that to Abraham and his descendants, then uh, that deed still stands. Of course, I guess the Arabs could uh, claim part of that deed as well as the Jews could. They? And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Abraham says, Okay. And God reminds him, saying, Now this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after thee. In other words, God says, Here's what I want you to do on your part. Remember, God was the only one that passed through the divided parts. It wasn't like a customary contract in the day where both parties Abraham just watched God. God's going to take care of it, but God says, I do want you to do something here, Abraham. Every man child little among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, for it'll be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now, I want you to think about this. This was the Old Testament sign of the covenants, why the Jews did this. They said this meant that we were part of the covenant people of God. They had the seal of the covenant in their very flesh. Now when we get to the New Testament, that seal of the covenant that was a very visible with the eye covenant back then, it was in the very flesh, but ours is in this spiritual dispensation. Every, everyone who is a descendant of Abraham by faith in other words, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're counted as children of the promise, is to have the seal of the covenant applied. And in the New Testament, that's baptism. And in the Old Testament, it could just be for the males, but remember in the New Testament, the Bible says there's neither male nor female, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. So everybody that accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is to follow him in baptism. That's We're accepting the seal of the covenant. Now, baptism don't save you. It can't save you. If it, it's just saying, I believe God, and God said to do this. This is my little act of a public declaration that I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and that I'm being obedient to the Lord because God said for me to be baptized if I'm a believer. And that's the seal of the covenant that's given to us. Just like in the Old Testament, all God's people had the seal of the covenant. A token of the covenant twixt me and you, and he that's eight days old be circumcised among you, every man, child, in your generation. He that's born in your house or bought with money of any stranger is going to get the seal of the covenant. Now, I'm here to tell you 
that I was bought, not with money, but not from a stranger, but somebody that we all know too well. I was bought from the devil himself. And if you recognize that you're a sinner, and when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament says you were bought with a price. It says you're not your own anymore because you were bought with a price, not with corruptible silver or gold, but you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So he says, anybody that's bought with money or any stranger in the Old Testament, even if they're not, if they're in your household, I want to be part of my covenant people. He that is bought with money must be circumcised, and my covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul will be cut off from his people. The people of God won't recognize him as one of them anymore because he won't be obedient to God. Now, that's why I said baptism don't save you, but don't act like it ain't important. God said to do it so the people of the church will recognize you as one of them. You've, you've professed that with the baptism. And if you don't, then you're living in disobedience to the Lord. He says, you've broken my covenant. I ask you to do that. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, Sarai, here he's going to change her name to how we know her now, Sarah. You'll not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. Sarai, but Sarah. And I'll bless her. And I'll give thee a son also of her. Now, so far, Sarah didn't have a son. That was Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid's boy, Ishmael. I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings shall be of her. Because if kings are going to come from Abraham, they're going to come from Sarah, his counterpart here. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed. This 99-year-old man just got the promise from God again that he's going to have lots of descendants. <laughs> and he fell on his face and he laughed. Now you can say, was that a laugh of doubt? I sort of think it was more a laugh of joy that Abram's thinking that, boy, God's going to do something big here through us. Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that's 100 years old? Because remember we started the chapter, he's 99. It's going to be a year before the kid's born. And shall Sarah, that's 90 years old, say she's just a young thing, Abram's wife. He robbed the cradle, didn't she? She is 90 and he is 100. And Abram said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before that. I've done got a boy. He's a teenager now. And God says, No, Sarah, your wife. See, God didn't recognize Hagar as his wife. Sarah, your wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And you'll call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him, not with Ishmael, but I'll establish this covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. You say, well, Isaac was a human being. He lived to be a ripe old age too. I forget how old he was when he died. We'll find out in a few chapters, but how can God make an everlasting covenant with him? Well, because when God makes an everlasting covenant with you, you say, well, I won't live for it to be an everlasting covenant. Yeah, you will. If you're one of God's people, that covenant still holds up when you get to the promised land too, doesn't it? When you get to heaven up there. And so he also said, Isaac won't be here on earth, but it's not only a promise to him forever, but to his descendants forever. Everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, God speaking, I have heard thee. Behold, I've blessed him and will make him fruitful. And will multiply him exceedingly. There's a lot of them Arabs over there today too, ain't they? Twelve princes shall he beget. And I'll make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, with Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time next year. And he, God, left off talking with him. And God went up from Abram, Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that same day as God had said unto him. Faith brings obedience. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son and all the men of his house born in that house bought with money of the stranger were circumcised with him. So once again, we'll close with saying it was important for their faith to bring obedience. They believed God. 
So they're going to put that into action because God says you need the seal of the covenant so everybody will recognize you as one of my people. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's important that you receive the seal of the covenant. Be baptized. That's your Christian baptism. That's the seal that you've trusted in Christ, and it's the seal of the covenant. I look back, and I, I was baptized at Poplar Bluff Baptist Church up in Teleco Plains, Tennessee. My little girl was baptized there. My dad was baptized there, and my grandpa was baptized there. It's, um, I guess that's, what, four generations of us all in the same pool up there. don't matter where you get baptized at. But if you trust the Lord and believe his word, follow him in baptism. That's important. See you next week.